In this video, we're going to explore how to model classes and packages in a class diagram with Argo UML. I've made similar videos in the past, and this video certainly applies to just about any type of program, but I am going to focus a little more on mobile development with this and some of the intricacies of mobile development, specifically in Android. I encourage you to watch this video and a follow-on video I'm going to do, which is going to be a, an example of why interfaces are valuable to us as programmers, especially in a multi-programmer environment. So I'm kind of keeping that in the back of my head as I look through and, and create this video. So first of all, what are the steps? The first thing is to open or install Argo UML or your UML tool of choice. I say Argo, Partially because this is kind of funny, but I started using Argo at the University of Cincinnati around uh, 2003, 2004, and it is probably the only thing that I still use today that looks exactly like it did that many years ago, which, you know, looking back, I guess is quite a while ago. Uh, so a, a freely available program that will write UML. And so I will hop over here to argouml.tigras.org. And it's funny, even that uh, even that uh, URL has been the same since about 2003. You can download and install it using this link here. For a long time, you could just launch it directly from a browser by uh, with a Java Web Start. I have found that modern browsers don't support Java Web Start like they used to. So sometimes I do just go ahead and download and install it. So open and install Argo. Argo is a tool written in Java, so it can run on just about any platform. Next, determine your package structure. Think of packages like folders. And this is the way that we want to organize our classes, both from a logical point of view and sometimes also from a unit of work point of view. Step three, this is one you might not have thought of, but is very important, especially in a complex project, especially in a multi-developer project, and that is determine the contract. In other words, one developer might be doing persistence, another developer might be doing user interface logic, and another developer might be doing something else like, uh, I don't know, service logic. What we don't want to do is have one developer fall behind, and then that puts all other developers at risk. That would be programming in serial, where we wait for one person to finish before the next person starts. Instead, what we want to do is we want to program in parallel so that we can make progress even if one of our colleagues has gotten behind or has been pulled off or something like that. For us to do that, we have to agree to a contract between parties, and that contract is an interface. Not a user interface, but an interface in programming terms. So determine a contract. I said I'll have a follow-on video on that. And then add classes to our diagram. And then show the relationship between classes. So is a indicates inheritance. A Toyota is a car, for example. Has a indicates composition. So a Toyota has an engine. It is made of an engine. A Toyota is not an engine itself. That would be an is a. But a Toyota has an engine. So that's a has a relationship. Finally, we have the uses a relationship, which is something like me is the owner of a Toyota, uses a Toyota to drive to work. So that's what we call a uses a relationship. Three of the fundamental relationships that we have in class diagrams. So here is Argo UML. And let's remember our steps. First, we want to think about packages. So a package is like a folder, a way to organize our classes. Actually, first, first, I'm going to give myself a little bit more room here. OK, so the packages are typically going to be broken up along several common lines. We'll oftentimes have, uh, well, first of all, what, what is it? How do we name a package? Typically, it's something unique, like a domain name in reverse. So I might say edu.uc. And then uc.edu isn't unique enough, so I need to add my own 6 plus 2, which is my unique identifier within the University of Cincinnati. So edu.uc.jonesbr. Notice all lowercase is common in Java. We tend to not use special characters in a package name either, so it tends to be just all lowercase. So edu.uc.jonesbr, that, that, that'll kind of be my base package name. After that, I'll put UI to indicate anything that's going to go into the user interface side. Uh, we should have that at the very minimum on any kind of program that has a user interface. One other thing that just about all programs should have is uh, data transfer objects. 
So edu.uc.jonesbr.dto. Now, a data transfer object is kind of like a typical noun, a person, place, or thing. It's something that just has attributes, in other words, kind of variables at the class level, and then getters and setters. So DTO, we'll kind of put that guy off to the side. In an enterprise application, in other words, something that runs on the server, a lot of times we'll have a, a few others as well. So edu.uc.jonesbr.service. This is where business logic goes. So things like buy one, get one free. The customer bought seven items. Which ones does the customer get free? That's a good example of business logic. Uh, or, you know, cancel your airfare within 24 hours. Okay, 24 hours starting when, what time zone, these kind of things. Additionally, in an enterprise application, we'll typically have something like edu.uc.jonesbr.dao, a data access object. So these are things that are interacting with the data storage mechanism uh, and could also be integ integrating with web services, anything else like that. It, the, th these are kind of the four core packages that you should have. Many times you'll have sub packages off of this for uh, larger programs. Now in mobile, one thing that's interesting is that we don't tend to have a whole lot of business logic or persistence. Mobile tends to be very heavy on user interface. And why is that? Well, that's because how do we, what is mobile? Uh, we oftentimes think of Android and iOS, which are two different programming languages. So our focus on those platforms is building the user interface. And then many times we will share the business logic and the data access logic but that will not be on the device itself. It oftentimes will be in the cloud. So on mobile, we tend to have a simpler package structure. We'll still have UI, still have DTO, and we might as well have something that talks to the outside world like JSON streams and um, cloud services, things like that. So we still need some kind of package that's gonna deal with that layer that's not user interface, but it's dealing with data. Service layer, maybe we'll have it, maybe we won't in, in, a, uh, in a mobile program. So I'll go ahead and remove that one, just simplify our diagram a little bit. And now we have three common packages that we can deal with. Okay, so how are we looking on our list? We've opened and installed Argo. We've determined the package structure. Now we need to determine the contract or the interfaces and then add classes. So let's work on that. The only real contract we need is in these uses a relationship. Is a has a, don't necessarily need there, although um, in a has a, I could see a good use for it there, but uses a is the relationship that we're looking at now. And if I go back over, we see the UI layer is going to be a series of activities in an Android program, and those are going to use some shared components. As a matter of fact, you might use, organize your own project so that instead of having a DAO package, you have a shared components package or something like that. But nonetheless, okay, let's consider what a few of these are going to be. We will probably need one for just kind of low level networking, and I'm going to call that network DAO, just like so. But that's going to come in the future, so let's not worry about that complexity just yet. Let's start with an interface that we're going to call uh, iPlant DAO. So an interface is our contract. It says, what can the UI layer call on the DAO layer? Now notice that an interface only has two boxes where a class has three. The reason is an interface only has method signatures uh, uh, up to Java 1.8. Java 1.8 let us do some default implementations, but let's not worry about that just yet. So an interface only has signatures. It doesn't have attributes. It doesn't have state. The, so the, the boxes that you see here are the name of the interface and then any operations or methods that that interface has. So that's a good way to know that this is an interface and not a class. It only has two boxes. It has the little interface indication up here. Those are a couple things that we're going to see. Okay, so I plant DAO. What are we going to want to do with plants? Well, we're probably going to want to fetch plants. Okay, and we might need a uh, search string so some kind of uh, some kind of string that indicates what our search is and then for the parameter we can return eh, i don't really see what i want here so i'll tell you what i'll just uh yeah i'll tell you what we'll do we will put in kind of a custom type here we'll have it return a list of plant dtos okay oh gosh now what's a plant dto 
Well, we've probably heard that before. By the way, notice that when I create this, I just drag it, make sure it's locked inside of that package. So DTO, remember, data transfer object is kind of like a noun. So a plant could be a noun. So for that, we just need a simple class. We could make an interface, but we don't necessarily have to in this case. So I'm going to call this class plant DTO. Okay, and we see we have the box in the middle. I can say add, I can say genus, and that will be a string type. Notice in UML how we do uh, attributes. We typically have the name of the attribute and then a colon and then the type of the attribute. This is a syntax that you'll see in many programming languages like uh, Kotlin, but it's also considered just kind of a generic identification syntax. So species, string, and I can keep going. I can say uh, cultivar, string, Cultivar is like a Fuji for a Fuji apple. And I can say common name. I can keep going. So I can say common name, colon string. And uh, I can even do something. Let's do something different. Let's say a global unique identifier. So a GUID. And we'll make that one an integer. So now you maybe have a better idea that, and then let's go ahead and move this over here. Now you have a better idea that this fetch plants method is returning a list or a collection of these DTOs. By the way, one nice thing about these package folders, as you notice, as I move the folder, all of the classes and interfaces inside of that folder um, uh, move as well. Okay, I, I, I have more to do in the DAO layer, but let's go ahead and look at this UI layer. Now in Android, typically all of our classes are going to extend from either activity or action bar activity. That is a class provided to us by Android. I don't necessarily have to represent that class, but I will, and I'm going to put it outside of our package structure because it is not a class that we create. Let's go ahead and call this activity. Okay, now we need to make an is a relationship. In other words, the controller in the model view controller layer, the controller for our uh, screens is essentially an extension of this class called activity. So there are a couple ways I can do that. I can drop our activity in here and I can kind of draw a line between the two or I can just kind of mouse over and hit this lower level arrow and you see a, a an open triangle with a solid line indicates inheritance, indicates an is a relationship. In other words, uh, an activity called GPS a plant activity or I can just call GPS a plant, but we'll go ahead and put activity on there. Extends from activity. And I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to drop him into the package here. So there we go, GPS a plant activity. Uh, let's not worry about state just yet. Uh, oops, I'm making, <laughs> making it worse. Okay, delete and delete and delete. A little bit cleaner interface there. Okay, now I also might have a search by color activity. So let me expand this a little bit. And let's try doing that one the other way. I'm just going to click on the three bars here, drop, and say search by color, okay, and enter. Now this time I'm kind of saying, okay, let's have search by color extend from activity. So this time what I can do is click that same arrow, but drag and drop. And now you see we're setting up that is a relationship just like so. Okay, so search by color, GPS a plant. These are the things that are going to handle things like button clicks on our screen. As a matter of fact, let's take a look. This is the Live Plant Places application that's on the Play Store. This is the search by color screen. Uh, so you see what I can do is I can click the little open icon here. It will take me to, or I can launch the camera either way. This one's going to take me into the um, gallery view and it's going to open a photo and it's going to show me up to 16 colors from that photo. I can click on one and then it's going to show me plants that match that color. Uh, just a moment as it downloads the photos. So you see I kind of had like a reddish orange and now it's pulled up some reddish orange plants. So that's the search by color. GPS a plant. This is the screen I really want to take a look at for the purpose of our discussion. So you notice what it has is some GPS information, plant name, location, and description. Now this is a this is uh, the screen that you're looking at here is a new kind of refresh of a screen that dates back to 2013 and one that I really, really, really tried to make as simple as I could. Uh, so searching for a plant, you just have to start typing the plant name. So you see, if I start typing Eastern, notice that it auto-completes. Now, that has to be data that is coming from somewhere because even just the word Eastern, you'll find there are quite a few matches to that word. 
So, okay, so GPS or plant is going to have to have some relationship with this DAO layer. And we might be tempted to say, okay, wait a minute. Well, we, we, we want to implement this interface into a class. Why don't we have it talk directly to this class? Don't do that. Don't do that. What we want to set up is a uses a relationship directly with an interface. So a uses a relationship is the solid line with no triangle on either side. And it simply says that GPS or plant activity has a dependency with this interface. Now, why that? Why go to the interface? Well, the interface is our contract. Remember, it's saying what each of our layers, uh, what each of our layers are obligated to do. Now, here's the risk. If we didn't go straight to the interface, what might happen is I'm the person doing the UI, somebody else is doing the DAO. And I say, are you, are you finished with your DAO layer yet? And the person says, no, because I don't know how to do it. Or we haven't covered that yet. Uh, maybe this persistence is something that's going to come in a later session. Okay, if I'm the UI layer and I'm waiting on the DAO person to finish his job, and that person is not going to have the information he needs to finish his job until it's too late, you see we've set up a dependency there that's going to make the entire project late. So let's consider a different approach. Instead of going to a class, we go straight to the interface. And what we say to the DAO person is, um, okay, are you ready? And the DAO person says, not yet, it's going to take a while. So then we tell the DAO person, no problem. Can you just make a stub that implements that interface, something that I can program against? And the DAO person says, yeah, sure. So we come out here and notice that this is a, di a dashed line with a capped arrow, and this is going to be our plant DAO stub. Okay, just a hard-coded implementation. You could call it a mock if you want to. Something that accepts a string, which is a search string, and returns a predictable list of results. Could be hard-coded, no problem. We just want to say this is a minimum viable product. This is a, a very simple implementation of this interface. Now, the UI person has enough information to go on uh, to be able to program against this interface while the actual implementation class has not been completed yet because it's still under development. So the UI person can use this contract and use this class which implements that contract. Okay, time progresses and our DAO person eventually gets a working DAO. So we're going to implement this interface again, but this time maybe we'll call it plant DAO impl, or we could call it plant JSON DAO. If we say this is one that's going to read a JSON feed, we could call it WSDAO if it's going to read a web service feed, something like that. Okay, note the dashed line again, and we don't need this guy. We'll go ahead and delete him. And uh, this one, because it's live, is going to do some network connectivity, so I can draw a little uses a relationship over here. Uh, and you notice there are plenty of places where I can put annotations in here. I can describe what that usage pattern looks like. So a lot of things that I can do. Uh, you could also say, gosh, well, because there's this list plant ETO, do you want to draw a line between these two? We could do that. Um, or yeah, we'll just leave it as it is for the moment. But nonetheless, I think we have a pretty nice looking uh, class diagram now. Now what I can do is I can say, okay, we'll save project as, and I can save this as Zargo. Uh, so we'll say plant places class diagram. And by the way, Argo actually supports a lot of different diagrams. Class is one, but there are several others. Uh, sequence, use case, state, so on and so forth. This is one that I see uh, a lot of people use. So uh, this is the one that I want to cover now. So anyway, we've saved the project. Now, what if we want to take this and put it into a document? Well, we can go to export graphics and we can save this as plant places class diagram, PNG or GIF or whatever you prefer. Hit save. And now we have a uh, PNG or a GIF or something that we can throw right into a diagram, but we can still come back and edit the source. So lots of good stuff, both an introduction to Argo and also a little discussion around uh, how we can use a class diagram to kind of separate work and also define these contracts. Stay tuned for the next video. In the next video, I'm going to go to a program that I wrote earlier, and I want to show how exactly the swap happens between the stub and the DAO. The nice thing is from the UI layer, you only have to change one line. If you're using a dependency injection framework, something like Dagger, there's even a whole other way that we can do it. So it, it really makes our program very flexible and it embraces this thing called polymorphism. 
More on that to come later. So thanks for watching this video. I uh, hope to see you around in the second part.